Who's your money on to be the next UKIP leader? Paddy Power, you beauty! Michael Heaver here for Westbourne Start. I'm with Henry Bolt and UKIP Leadership. Good morning. Good morning. Um, first thing, Henry, uh, obviously, what, what's your background? You may not, a lot of people may not know much about mm -hmm. you. Could you give us a bit about your background? Well, I'm, uh, I'm a former tank soldier. Um, I was later commissioned into the infantry, so I was an infantry officer. Um, I left the army in 1990, joined the police, but also stayed in the Territorial Army and mobilised to go out to Bosnia as a TA officer commanding regular troops in a strategic intelligence unit in Bosnia for a year. I've um, done a variety of things since. I was Chief of Operations for the ceasefire operations in Macedonia in 2001. I was Crisis Management Advisor for the Albanian Prime Minister. I've led uh, UK efforts to disrupt tra transnational organised crime across the Balkans. Uh, I was uh, the district, uh, district Governor for the United Nations in Kosovo for a year, so establishing and then running as its President and CEO local government. Um, I've, uh, I was the uh, head of global border programs for the, what was then 56 countries of the Organisation of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is the world's largest intergovernmental security organisation. And I doubled hat, double hatted as senior advisor to the Secretary General. And more latterly, I was chief planner for EU common security and defence policy. Uh, with particular responsibility for Ukraine and, and Libya. So uh, a little bit of a window on uh, how the European Union works. And I still lecture, actually, for the Austrian Defence Academy and, and the Swedes and others on uh, the decision-making processes in the EU. So, uh, yeah, I know how the EU works. Yeah. Well, how's the campaign going anyway, then? I think it's going quite well. Um, I entered it slightly late. Uh, I entered it because I, I looked at the, the people who were standing um, and I actually thought that uh, whilst there's some very good people standing, um, I felt that they didn't necessarily have the leadership background in the broad uh, array of areas that they, they needed to have it to be successful. I mean, I, I, I believe that the party is at a critical moment. Of course, this leadership election has to work, but it's also critical for the country. If we're not able to organize ourselves and project ourselves effectively into British politics very rapidly, um, the Conservatives are going to have the run with Brexit and we can see them slipping almost every day uh, on Brexit, you know, sort of basically selling our, our foreign policy and our, our defence assets to the EU um, just the uh, day before yesterday. So, uh, you know, this, the only party that can provide a, a proper Brexit opposition is us and it's particularly important because it's not just about getting out. It's about making a success of it afterwards, making sure that we're sort of secure, we're trading, we're, 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 we're building up our economy and so on as well post-Brexit. And, and Brexit is going to set us up for success later on. So we've got to get it right. Talking about the EU and defence, what did you make of uh, Jean Claude Juncker's comments uh, about the European Defence Corporation pushing forward for 2025 and all the rest of it? How big a threat do you think that is? I, it's a massive risk because, firstly, the defence policy of the European Union, even if you say, let's, you know, and, and, and there are people who say, well, isn't that, isn't that sensible to coordinate and, and mutually support in the area of security? And I, I would say it is, but you've got to remember that, um, that defence policy in the European Union, like it is in any country, is actually subordinate to the foreign policy. And if we're out of the European Union, we're not going to be sitting at the table shaping EU foreign policy. So if we give assets to the European Union in defence and security, we've got to remember that we're not going to be shaping or being able to scrutinise how those assets are used, because Brussels is going to fix that, the other 27 are going to fix that post-Brexit. So this is a very misguided effort on the, on the part of the UK to, to support the EU. Jean-Claude Juncker's approach um, is, is one of expansionism, ever, ever deeper centralisation, and, you know, do we want to be part of that? Of course we don't. So the more the government slides on this, the more we're going to get sort of sucked in to the EU whilst not being able to shape it. It's crazy. It just doesn't make sense. We're far better off if we want to influence the EU, build up our own capabilities, be dominant in, 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 in our own foreign policy, and that way we are going to influence the environment that the EU operates on. That's a far more effective way of doing it. 
Now, in terms of the, the, the leadership hustings, what are members telling you? What messages are coming through? What are you saying? What's your pitch that differentiates you from the other candidates? Uh, oh, okay, get a, few, get a few questions in that one question. Um, what are members saying? Well, first of all, members are saying that they feel that they've been isolated by the leadership of the party over, over the last months, a year or so. Um, they feel as though they've been disconnected. Decisions are being made within the party uh, by, by a clique at the top. Uh, and that they've not been consulted, they don't know what's going on until it's a fait accompli. Uh, I think that's a valid com concern. There, there hasn't been good internal communications, uh, certainly not recently. Uh, so that needs to be improved. I think other things more broadly that are coming out are there is a great concern over immigration, increasing concern, I would say, and, and actually it's even stronger in some parts of the country than, than others, but it's a concern across the board. And that links with the, the Islamic question. Um, so there's a lot of concern about the loss of, of British culture and way of life in that regard. So these are, sort of, these, are, these are themes, but Brexit still comes through loud and clear as the main priority, getting that right. And, the, and members feel that the party has been quiet on that issue, too quiet. The, uh, in terms of where I stand on it, I mean, I, I think it, Brexit, as I've already explained, is, is critically important for our country to make sure it's, it's done in a way that launches us as a global trading nation, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a prosperous, secure and, uh, and a confident nation going forward. So it has to be done right. So that remains our core task, our core purpose. And that, in that way, perhaps I don't differ with the others. The other thing, though, I think, is that vast swathe of the population who are, who are left uh, without a voice in local government. In, 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 their not voice isn't heard in, in development planning, isn't heard in policing. They're just, they're just ignored. And I think we are, as a party, in a fantastic position to give them a voice because we, we, you know, we, we're, we're a bold party. We're prepared to stick our, our necks out and say things that others aren't prepared to say. We are prepared to say, look, you know, we don't necessarily fit into a political dogma. If you're suffering a particular problem in a particular community, let's find the right solution for that, regardless of whether it might be traditionally a, a socialist problem or a, or a, a right wing, uh, a socialist solution or a right wing solution. If it's the right solution for that community, it's the right solution. But I think the biggest thing there is recognising that if we're going to deliver anything positive, we must organise the party. We must get more professional in what we do. We must uh, support our candidates a lot better. We must prepare them for their campaigns, support them in their campaigns, and support them once in office. We must enhance the, co the communication amongst everybody, and we must involve members more in, what the, in pos policy development. So these are all things that I'm, I've, I've been talking about during the hustings and in my campaign. OK, well, you've been quite outspoken. You've made some comments about under the wrong leadership, we could swing away from our traditional secular values and stances towards something far darker. You said the last thing UK, UKIP needs to be is to become the UK Nazi party. Is that aimed towards any particular candidate at all? No. Uh, what's, uh, give us a bit more info on it, It's not aimed, it, and it really is not aimed towards any particular candidate. Um, there are candidates w w that... Uh, would seek or, or are seeking to pursue a particular agenda, a particular set of policies, a fairly narrow set of policies, uh, narrow objectives, if you like, which are, are, are valid to discuss. And indeed, uh, the points raised by, by, by these candidates are, are absolutely valid points and need to be addressed, no question. However, if we become a niche party and we go down the, 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 uh, the, the road of being a, a hardline movement dedicated to uh, either uh, anti-Islam or uh, the, the um, quoting others now, the, the overthrow of the Westminster elite and our, 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 parliament, our Westminster system of government, then we are at risk of really becoming not just a radical party, but a, a revolutionary party in, 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 a, in a slightly worrying sense. We are also not going to be taken credibly as uh, in, in other areas such as Brexit. That's the reality. We may not like the reality, but the reality is that if the media, the public at large, do not see us as a credible party that can deliver on a broad platform, if they see us more as a niche, really sort of kind of revolutionary party, then, um, then we're not gonna have the, 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 the means, the traction, to deliver on such things as Brexit and our future prosperity and security. 
I, I reiterate though that it is, it's not to say that we have not got a problem with immigration or Islam. And I've been quite hard line in what I think we should build into the party's policies to deal with that. Um, and I also think we need to go down the route of really exploring uh, electoral reform and there's, there's a lot of potential there for some elements of direct democracy in there too. So it's not that I'm, I'm, I'm saying these are irrelevant issues that shouldn't be discussed. They very much are relevant and they very much should be discussed, but they need to be in a broad context. Other than Brexit, what would be, you know, what would a Henry Bolton UKIP, what would you be campaigning on? What would be the, the big message going out if you did win the leadership? You mean policy issues? Yeah, on a policy issue other than Brexit. Well, already I've been holding the government to account in the last week or so over the comments that we discussed earlier uh, about the government selling out and, uh, our, our foreign policy and the military sort of off to the EU. Um, we've talked about Juncker. I've talked about the need to address uh, what one of the other candidates would call cultural Marxism, the, the sort of the extreme left and the way that our, our uh, history is, uh, they're attempting to rewrite our history, pull down our monuments, change who we are. Um, well, if they do that, then they're going to dictate our future, and it's going to be a false future, which isn't going to build our, com our nation or our confidence. So, um, the, these are all issues that I've already already raised. I think you know what I'm going to do, and as I say, I've already started doing it, is hold the government to account effectively on Brexit. That's the first thing. The second thing is to start giving everybody a voice, and that's mobilising and supporting our, our branches and our, our regional level. So these are, the, these are the core things that I'm going to engage on. Now, when we talk about particular policies, I mean, if anybody wants to ask me what my position is on, a, on healthcare or education or defence or, or, or policing or local government, fine. But that's my opinion. And my opinion is relevant, I agree, but I, I've, uh, I've got a design for involving the, the party members in developing party policy. First of all, I would revert immediately to the 2015 manifesto as the baseline. Secondly, my spokesman would be supported by groups of up to 10 people that, that are, are drawn from their membership because of subject matter expertise. So they're able to assist that spokesman in, in having a comprehensive uh, sort of suite of expertise for that por portfolio. Anybody in the party will be able to propose uh, uh, policy. It'll go up to that group, it'll be assessed, and if, if considered valid, then they'll develop it into a, a, a party white paper for approval or not at, uh, at conference. Now, what I'm saying there is, I mean, the, the members are the party. I mean, without the members, we wouldn't have a party. They need to be involved in pol policy development. So here, let's have that debate. Let's have that discussion about what we do with healthcare. But the start point is the 2015 manifesto. And finally, if I just ask you, obviously, as a, an sort of expert on security, how mm. do you see the jihadi threat? How do you think uh, we should combat it? How do you assess the government's performance on that? Three questions. Um, uh, first of all, the jihadi threat is serious, and I think getting a great deal more serious. Uh, Islamic State are under huge pressure in Iraq and in Syria. Um, they have been in Libya. Uh, I have uh, these sort of organisations need to demonstrate that they are active and effective in order to recruit and to gain donors. It's the same as a political party, really. Um, so they need to demonstrate that they're engaging. Now, they're, the, the obvious way for them to do that is to embark upon a serious campaign in Europe and in this country. First point is we have to secure our borders. We have no national border strategy. There's nothing to bring cohesion together on our borders and there's no plan for our borders going forward. You know, even Albania has a, a border strategy. I know because I helped write it. They, but we do not, which is a massive hole in our, in our security. We're cutting back on policing and one of the first things to go in the cuts on, of policing is, is the intelligence capability. The backroom functions are being lost. Um, so there are a range of th things that we, we can do. And I think we also need to look at the for foreign funding here. We need to stop Qatari and Saudi and Wahhabi funding of, our, of uh, independent schools and of mosques. We need to ensure, rather like a Church of England vicar, uh, that imams are trained here, they're funded here, they're licensed here, they understand the British way of life, British culture. And we need to start to assimilate our, our immigrant com uh, uh, communities a lot more, be uh, a lot more effectively. Into, into British society. Anybody who carries a British passport should understand what it means to be British. And it's not about getting 
getting some sort of welfare payments or, or something like that. It's about being British and buying into the British identity. Um, and on that, I think we should revamp the Treason Act, take it out of the Public Order Act, and make it fit for purpose to hold anybody who, who embarks upon um, planning, preparing, or committing a terrorist offence. They are traitors. They are not terrorists, they're not criminals, they are traitors. And anyone, uh, but the, at the moment, the law isn't fit for, for use in that purpose. It needs to be. I don't want some, some guy you know, deciding that he's going to go down in history amongst some sort of community in Iraq or somewhere as, as, a, as a martyr because he's blown himself up in, in, in somewhere in this country. That, pa that person should be fully aware that they will be labelled forever traitor um, if they've got a British passport. If they haven't, if they're, if they're a foreign national, we need to get rid of them immediately. But at the moment, we have a problem with immigration in that we're part of something called the Dublin Three Agreement, which is a European Union agreement, and it means that we can't, as we should be able to under international law, send people who come to this country, try and enter this country from the European Union illegally. For example, they get in the back of a truck and come from France. We're not allowed to send them back to France. We're only allowed to send them back to the country through which they entered the European Union. And most of the time we've got no clue as to which country that is, so we can't send them anywhere. Um, and if they're, I don't know, Ethiopian, but they claim to be from Eritrea and they've got no documents, neither Ethiopia nor Eritrea will take them back. We have no choice but to keep them because of that Dublin Three Agreement. So we need to withdraw from that immediately. Henry Bolton, thank you very much. Thank you.